شكرا لحضوركم بروح بوجوه قديمه جديده موجوده استاذ عبد الحسين استاذ ولاد العوار استاذ مهند الدرة اهلا وسهلا فيكم بس حابب اقدم اذنك للمره الثانيه عم بتقدم توك او نقاش او تطمع لاني بحب ال ممكن نقاش لاحقا في نص المصير القادم هو هو البحث عن جلساته عم تعمل الوضع عن دور الفن الاردني والثقافه المصريه بشكل عام بدي اقدم بس اقول لك تو تاكيد ذا بيج كومينج اي وود لايك تو انتروديوس اليزابيث از ا بي اس بي كانديديت اوف اسلاميك ارت هيستوري ان ديبارتمنت اوف هيستوري اوف ارت At the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, she is further specialized in modern art and visual culture and the Middle East. One of her first projects was co-curating an exhibition of posters from the 1979 Iranian Revolution and Iran, Iran War at the University of Chicago in 2011. Following the 2009 presidential protest in Iran, she completed her master's thesis on the art of uprising. Later, she published an article titled 30 Years Later Iran and Visual Culture from the 1979 Revolution to the 2009 Peer Movement. Her forthcoming article in 2011, We Learned About Protest in Bahrain, will explore the trans transformative effect of iconotaxism and spurring new creators for a popular dissent. 2013, she was awarded the Ramda. ASAC Prize for Best Casual Paper in Modern Contemporary Art of Art by the Association for Modern Contemporary Art of the Arab World, Iran, and Turkey at the Middle Eastern Studies Association Conference. In 2013, she was also awarded an academic year fellowship to continue studying Arabic while conducting free dissertation research in modern practices and collections in the Levant and Nigo. For this year, for the best year of her dissertation paper, she receives research fellowships from the American Academy of Research Institute, Institute in Iraq, and the Rakhama International Research Award, University of Michigan's three year fellowship, and of course, Dara Al Fulun on a PhD research uh, fellowship. Uh, we can enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Dr. How's the sound of the back? Is it good? Great. Uh, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Uh, for those of you who attended my first talk in May, this is going to be much more informal. A presentation of my fieldwork thus far in Jordan. Um, but before I get started, I first have to send a big thank you to the staff at the Rep of Moon for all of their help and assistance for the past six months. From writing, rewriting, faxing, official letters to ministries, for archival research, for taking me literally to government ministries or artist studio visits and putting me in touch with contacts uh, and helping me so much in the research, I have to send a big thank you to Ahmed Zatari, Yasmin Nabosi, Inal, Luma, Mohammed, Ali Yas, and Allah and Rajda. But most importantly, I have to thank Suma Shaman for this amazing opportunity. The fellowship at Dar al Fanun is unlike any fellowship in the world. And so Purim Rama we talked about this evening comes could only have happened because of the PhD fellowship here at Dar al Fanun. And it should pop up later during my talk. Um, uh, as Dar al Fanun and Suma Shaman have played an immensely formative role in the history of art here in Jordan. And Speaking of Dara Tosin as well, we're all sitting here inside this research center talking about what it means to discuss, to, to research, or to even talk about a history of art of Jordan and doing research on art in Jordan. And in my mind, Dara Tosin is the only place where you can think about the past, the present, and the future of art in Jordan. So there's a reason we're all sitting in this room right now, hopefully having a discussion about what Jordanian art history is or will be in the um, so before I start going through some of my field work, I just want to sort of make a preface of what my dissertation research is, because um, this talk is a look at sort of practices of doing research on art in Jordan. Because my dissertation is uh, following the modern dynamics of Islamic artistic practices and material culture. So I'm looking at several different countries, including 
Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, and Jordan, and the role that Islamic material culture plays in modernist art practices in the Middle East. So in order to do this research, when I came to Jordan, I first had to actually figure out how to do research on art history in Jordan. Um, but this is an example of one of the artists in dissertation from Iran. His name is Siar Pajani, and this is a painting he produced in 1957. Um, showing some uh, classical Persian made painting, but in a modernist uh, sort of deconstructed context. So just to give you a sense of the sort of materials that I'm working with outside of Jordan, before we start talking about Jordan. So when I first came to Dharat and began doing my research, uh, for those of you who came to my first talk in May, I talked about some of my research on the museum practices in the Gulf and in the Arab world as well as in Iran. Um, so in terms of, if you're an art historian and you want to do research on art history, you have to find where the works are, where is the art, where are the collections. And beyond the art museums, oftentimes you find works in other museums as well, ethnographic museums, folklore museums, and other places, especially if you're doing research on historic materials and not just modern and contemporary art. And so lucky for me, within a couple months of me arriving at Dara this noon, I teamed up with Spring Sessions, uh, which is co-directed by Noura Tassani and Tulin Tu. And the project several of us are working on is the Museums of Amman project. So we're going through the museums, and there's roughly at least 27 to 30 museums in just Amman city limits alone. And what we're doing is doing different sort of research and artistic practices and engagements with these museums. And for my research, that has been hugely helpful in the finding materials and thinking about sort of different ways of thinking about heritage of Jordan and Palestine and how it relates to modern art and contemporary art in the region as well. And the first museum in Amman, which we've been researching the most in the past couple months, is the Jordan Archaeological Museum uh, on top of the Citadel, or Jabal al -Kalba. So this museum, in my mind, is one of the most interesting and significant museums in the region, uh, let alone in Jordan, for the role it plays both in the history of Jordan and then also in hopefully the future of the museum as well, and what sort of potential research uh, sort of purposes it can bring about. So, the Citadel Museum was roughly constructed from 1950 to 52. We know that they started clearing the site of the museum starting in late 1949 to make space for it. But the actual history of the museum is not really well known. And so part of my research has been going to the Department of Antiquities here to find Lancaster Harding, who was the director of the Department of Antiquities in the 30s and 40s here, um, to see sort of the roots and beginnings of what was the first museum in Amman, and the first museum built specifically for heritage in Jordan. And what, uh, what I found just a couple weeks ago was a report he wrote in 1940, or roughly 1940 41, uh, which is the first reference we've ever found to any museum uh, in Amman. And he was talking basically about the need for a museum, why no one was paying attention to anything in Jordan. All the attention was being paid to archaeological activities in Iraq, in Egypt, and Palestine. And in this report, he talks about how much they're finding in Jordan, how much intense, critical, and vital heritage there is to Jordan and to the world being found and being conducted by archaeological projects. And everything was just stuffed in a tiny store in the department. So they had no way to document, no way to photograph, and no way to publicize the stuff they were finding in Jordan. And so the first museum, uh, where he basically goes into towards the end of the report, talking specifically about this need for a museum, then, a place where we can work through objects and sort of take stock of what we're finding. And what's interesting about the report towards the end is he then talks about the Palestine Architectural Museum which was built uh, starting around 1929, 1930, 1935. And he talks about up until the present, an arrangement has been enforced with the Palestine Architectural Museum, whereby all objects were sent there on long exhibition. But with Palestinian affairs in their present precarious state, it has been considered desirable to bring back to Amman all these objects. And then he goes on towards the end um, of the report to say that the government had hoped to build the nucleus of the museum during the present year, but with the many calls on its slender financial resources, it has found itself unable to do so. So we know that the museum, the first idea or hope of the museum, started in 1940. Um, at the time, most of the finds that weren't being, uh, the objects being found that weren't being kept in the department was being sent to Jerusalem to the Palestinian Archaeological Museum. 
And then what we found in 1951, um, and this is Lancaster Garden in the center right there, I think on top of Jumbo Bella, I'm not quite sure what site he's working on right now. Um, but in the first ever uh, review report for the Department of Music of Jordan, the very first news notice is about the construction of the Jordan Archaeological Museum that was being continued from hopefully until early 1952 when it would be opened. And Mr. Harrison, Barnes, and Hubbard are the architects. And Mr. Harrison's experience of museum architecture guarantees a good, well lighted exhibition hall. So this means the architect we now know was Mr. Austin Harrison, the same architect who was the chief architect of British Columbia Palestine from the 1930s until 1948, and the chief architect of the Palestine Archaeological Museum. So there's a very direct relationship, not just in terms of collecting practices of archaeological finds of trans in Palestine in the 1930s and 1940s, but the actual same architect designed both museums. Before uh, the, the Palestine Archaeological Museum, which was funded by an endowment from uh, Rockefeller, uh, I believe $2 million at the time, which was an endowment initially rejected by Cairo's archaeological departments and Cairo's museums. Um, but Palestine uh, built this museum and used Austin Harrison as its architect. And what's interesting about Austin Harrison, what we've been finding now that we know who the architect of the Zidwell Museum is, was he actually came to Amman first in 1925. And he designed the British residence in Amman, which was constructed from 1926 to 1928. So we have now this architect who was bouncing back and forth from Amman to Jerusalem and uh, working not just with museum architecture, but with government mandate buildings and so on. And so this again points to the real historic significance of the Citadel Museum on top of Jabal al -Kalba. And one of Austin Harrison's traits. Uh, he was trained in London, he's British, he trained in London, and he was trained in the Beaux Arts style, but was also a real ad, uh, avid uh, study of Islamic architectural history. Uh, so he was an Orientalist, but within a modernist mode. And this is probably why the British mandates liked him as their architect, because he was doing things in a vaguely abstract, modernist way, but using local uh, vernacular architectural techniques, such as the Palestinian vaults of um, uh, so, uh, so stonework vaultings and other sort of uh, local architectural practices, but using them to build these big colonial government structures. So one that that's interesting about Austin Harrison in terms of his role in building the first museums in the region, or two of the first museums in the region, um, but then also his study of Islamic architecture, for my purposes, is fascinating. And he talks openly about studying the Papa Palace, Ottoman Pavilion architecture, and his interest in trying to update it to this modernist style. And uh, one uh, art historian has called his work sort of Near Eastern modernism or stripped, pared down Orientalism. Um, so, this plan on the right is the plan of the Chenli Krios, or the Pavilion of the Papa Palace in Istanbul. So, you can see it's a square plan or what we would call a 4 one plan in Islamic architecture. And the plan is very similar to the plan of the Citadel Museum. So we're seeing, again, so you're seeing these layers of sort of references happening inside the museum itself. And again, this uh, historian who's been working on Austin Harrison's work, mostly in Palestine, said that Harrison felt justified using this 4 one plan for climactic, functional, contextual, and symbolic reasons and as if any further justification was necessary, an early Islamic 4 Iwan pavilion overlooks the center of Amman from its area of the Acropolis. And this is about the residents from 1926 in Amman. So, this is like, we've, there's been no literature research done on the Jordanian Archaeological Museum, the Citadel Museum. But what we know is that he used the Umayyad throne hall, the Umayyad palace from Jabal Palma, to build the British residents over the past like, third or fourth circle here in 1926. So it stands to reason that when he came back to Jordan after 1948, and after he first built the Palestine Archaeological Museum, he used the same plan from the Umayyad Palace on the uh, Citadel to build the Jordan Archaeological Museum on the Citadel. So there's this uh, possible direct reference to Amman's Umayyad Palace, 
um, but also to other Islamic architectural buildings as well. So just to give some insight then into what we know so far about the architect and what sort of uh, historical significance the Citadel Museum has. And then when you look inside the museum, again, so funding, as you can have from the Lancaster Harding letter that I showed, was limited in early Jordan, uh, 1940s. And so it's not as big as the Palestine Fashion Museum, but you can see similarities. So you see the comfort ceiling, you see the high ceilings and the high bay windows, and the shelves are quite similar. So when Austin Harrison came to Jordan to build the Jordan Public Museum, uh, he definitely used similar techniques as the Palestine Fashion Museum. So they, uh, the museum has the significance locally and regionally, but then the point I'm trying to make is also internationally in terms of the extension of Islamic architectural references into the 20th century and also global modernist architecture. So a small museum at Seoul Museum, which has not been renovated or updated since at least 30 years, if not since it was originally constructed. Uh, we know when it was first constructed, it had leaking issues as well. So if you've been inside, you've seen some, uh, some, some slight damage on the roofing that comes from its original construction in 1952. Um, but along with that, another reason why we're so interested in this museum is the role it plays in early art history of Amman. So if you've walked into the museum and you've seen the, the map, uh, when you first walk in past the inquiry's desk, the map was painted by uh, considered one of the pioneers of modern art in Jordan, Mohan Dora. So Mohan Dora, who was born and raised and grew up in Amman back in the day, uh, was present at Dobrokala, was a part of some of the archaeological activities, and he uh, painted this map inside the museum, which is still the same map you see today. So the museum, historically, in terms of museum studies, architectural studies, all of that museum is important, but especially it has one of the first paintings by one of the foremost artists of Jordan. And people at the museum don't know that this is by Mohan Adora either, so the goal is to get this information out there about the historical significance of the museum and uh, yeah. And this photograph is of Mohana, I think from 1963, on top of Jebel Kala was the, the hand of Hercules. And so Mohana Doras, uh, as one of the first artists to, to grow up in Amman, and he was here amongst two of the first sort of painters that ever really worked in Jordan. Ziyad Suleiman, who was a Turkish soldier and came to uh, Jordan and Palestine roughly in the 1930s. And this is one of his paintings from 1941. And then George Hadis was a Russian uh, uh, ex-soldier that came to Palestine and then after 48 then he came to Jordan or to Amman as well. And so these two artists were two of the uh, first artists sort of offering uh, painting lessons for young artists in the late 1940s and 1950s Amman. And Ziyad and Suleiman actually was the first artist to have an exhibition of painting ever in Jordan at the old Hotel Philadelphia, which used to be right across from the ancient amphitheater downtown. So this is a photograph of the hotel from the 1930s. And the reason I'm showing all of this is because it gives sort of the context to understand the situation of when some of the first artists that became Jordan's pioneering modern artists were, were growing up. And so to, uh, to show the map again from the Citadel Museum, you can see an old downtown historic Amman is completely different than what Amman looks like today. And the amphitheater especially hadn't been restored, it hadn't been changed so much. And it has this sort of decay of history about it. It has that feel of like what the ancient archaeological sites, when they were first doing all these projects in the early history of Jordan, looked like. And that's what he chose to put inside the Civil Museum as a painting of the amphitheater as well. And again, so these early artists, often impressionistic landscape painting, um, sort of depicting the landscape and some of the buildings and the sites and so on. And this was sort of the first training that most artists in Jordan had. And then, so, everyone hear me in the back? Fine? We're good? Okay, good. So, 
you have these early artists engaging with often archival teams, going off on the projects and digs, painting for the archival teams, the maps, doing the sketches. They often did the pottery sketches for the archival teams as well. And then you have slowly, more so in the, the late 50s and 60s, then you have artists really sort of coming into their own and making their own practice. Uh, so this photograph shows Ronald Dora in the studio in uh, the, I think, early 60s, and working on his famous painting, The Woman of Salt. Uh, and you can see in the background, there's many portrait paintings, <coughs> as well as some couple of abstract works. And for my research purposes, the, the history of Jordanian art, in terms of its museums, its collections, as well as the role of artists in, in basically constructing a history and heritage of art here, um, one of play a very important role in this in terms of both being involved in the early, early roots of Jordanian art, but also teaching hundreds and hundreds of students that came forward. Um, he helped found one of the first um, institutes of painting downtown, Institute of Music and Arts in 1971. And so seeing his work gives a sense of perspective, one of the sort of genealogies of modern art in Jordan. And so from, again, just going back, these impressionistic landscape paintings that feel a bit classical, they feel a bit, you know, there's not uh, much here since it's simply to Jordan or maybe Palestine and these works. You then have artists starting to depict everyday life, you have them starting to depict types and figures, woman of salt, uh, and then also starting to experiment as well. So many artists came to study in Europe and then came back. Some artists stayed or they traveled to the Iraqs, uh, Baghdad to the fine arts, uh, or to Cairo, to other regional um, art programs. But there wasn't an art program in Jordan, not until the 80s, at Yarmouth University, or besides the informal salons and studios that sort of popped up briefly at different points downtown. So the, the roots of Jordanian artistic practice are interesting in that it brings together many different types of dreaming and but, sort of these attempts to get uh, sort of an institution founded on online. Um, so within all of that, that's what makes some of these works interesting is seeing the different ways in which artists would embrace abstraction or reject abstraction or embrace realism or impressionism and so on, uh, specifically within the history of the historical context of Amman. So these are two examples of uh, drawings of moves into an abstraction but still maintaining some sort of representational uh, view or on the right, you can see him portraying a, a figure and so on. And again, so Mohamedou is known foremost now for his abstract paintings, um, not so much the formal portraiture. Uh, and what's interesting is he spent time working with one of the foremost American art critics, you've heard of Hannah Greenberg, uh, in Salzburg in 1973. So you have a Jordanian artist who was uh, working with one of the advocates of abstract expressionism. Have you ever heard about how the CIA was exporting American abstract painting against the Soviet socialist realism? That's from the Greenberg. So that's very interesting that uh, Mohamed Duro was spending time with Mohamed Greenberg in sort of an art historical sense. But likewise, then he spent uh, many years in Moscow as a Jordanian ambassador. So then you have, this is actually in the studio, you have a photo of him with the foremost abstract expressionist American uh, art critic, as well as with Lenin and Tolstoy from Russia. So again, Soviet realism versus American abstraction is two of the sort of dichotomies of uh, modern art history, at least from the American and uh, uh, European uh, perspective. And so this is one of his more recent abstract works, in which you can see hints towards figuration or representation as well as an abstraction. He's also known as the first Cubist painter in Jordan. So you're seeing many of these different elements come about in his uh, recent work as well. And so as one of the main mover and shakers who helped found uh, the first, one of the first schools here, as well as one of the main institutions, and first director of the Department of Arts, and um, heavily involved in the Ministry of Culture, it's a specific genealogy of art and painting in Jordan that's specific to the history of Amman as well. So again, this goes back to the early days of Amman's history as a city, as a site for art historical heritage, and goes back to museums as well. The other big art historical genealogy 
um, also the, uh, presented in terms of Jordanian art history, is Behram Sanzade, who uh, played a huge role in uh, spurring on abstract painting in Jordanian art as well. And Adila Rebi Hania, who's um, formerly director of the Khalil Sakakini Center in Ramallah, has been doing fantastic research and scholarship on Fekhon Sanzade. So I'm not going to get too much into Fekhon Sanzade because there's already some stellar work being done on her, uh, especially on her role in spurring abstraction and teaching young uh, students here in Ramallah. So, I mean, so two photographs of Fekhon Sanzade, and I absolutely love this, like, Huge, huge painting, and she was so small next to her work. Uh, but large, large canvas abstract works, and then also portraiture as well. The one on the left is here at Marvel's Noon as part of the Shaman collection, and then the one on the right is called Feminite. So, very different ways of working. Again, similar to Mohana Dora, playing with creation, representation, as well as with uh, abstraction. And she came to Amman and started a small salon with several students, uh, as you can see in the photograph on the bottom left. And those students, who continued many of these abstract practices to this day, helped found, two of them helped found, two art museums in Amman. The one we're all sitting in, the art museum, close to the Hashemon, and the, this is a painting example from the Petra series on the left, top left, and then Wijnan Ali, who founded or found the National Gallery of Fine Arts on the other side of Bode over by our uh, campus. And you can see if this is one of her paintings from the Women of Karbala series, uh, which is interesting. Uh, in terms of, again, my research of looking at the dynamics of Islamic uh, sort of heritage and uh, visual culture in modernist painting. And then another work by another one of the Sanzi's students in Nasser who uh, helps run the gallery, Artisana Gallery 14, over the way on the Jumbo line. So this is a totally different, yet also heavily important uh, sort of uh, genealogy or trajectory of modern artists working in Amman in the 70s and 80s, when that's really when things begin to take off in terms of building institutions, founding uh, 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 art schools and universities, and then also actually heavily building museums or places and galleries uh, for arts and for uh, collecting heritage in Amman. And in order to do that, uh, in order to build the first art museum, the National Gallery on the other side of Bunde, there was an art suite held in 1972 by Rujdan and also Her Highness Mona. And this art suite is really interesting because it was funded in order to raise money to build the first art museum in Amman. And um, not much has uh, been researched documented about this art suite. So I went to the National Library to find these uh, exhibition photographs at the opening of the first gallery in Amman. The first, uh, well, not the first gallery, but the first uh, exhibition was at the Philadelphia Hotel. But the gallery that still exists today is at the Intercontinental Hotel. Uh, was the uh, opening in 1972. So this is the announcement showing the ribbon cutting. And this art suite also had an exhibition at the Citadel Museum. And we also know there's a couple other activities going on during this art suite. So uh, again, completely uh, organized and sort of pushed through by young artists or artists working to make the art scene in Amman happen. And this is the exhibition catalog from this uh, first uh, exhibition in 1972 at the gallery. And you can see the list of very familiar names if you know any uh, of the artists working um, in Amman. So we have Ahmed Nawash, Rafi Laham, Aziz Amora, and Mahadur, Dalai, Vijdan. So these artists were involved in uh, what was becoming a very active scene at the time. There's two more examples of the catalog. And eventually, in 1980, they opened the Jordan National Gallery of Fine Arts. And the gallery was sort of this nucleus around which several different art movements happened in the 1980s in Jordan. Um, there was a brief sort of surrealist movement called the Group of Young Artists, and they lasted about six or seven years. 
There was also an impressionist movement, uh, which Wa Nuni, you can see the painting on the right, was a member of. And then several artists that are working today were heavily influenced by these sort of art movements from the 80s. Uh, when the Jordan National Gallery first opened, it helped really spur on um, uh, hosting exhibitions for Jordanian artists, but also exporting Jordanian art for the first time. So they sent Jordanian artworks all over the world, Asia, South America, North America, Europe. And so that's really when um, Amman started to become part of the international scene as well. And then, after the National Gallery opened, our Dark was not opened, officially inaugurated in 1993, which was renovated in these buildings by Amman Kamash, an architect who also practices as a painter. And he, uh, his style of sort of landscape impressionist painting was heavily influenced um, by Fawad Limi. So again, this like there's these connective docks that go back and back through the museums, these different art historical movements, which are really directed largely by the artists themselves too. So I mean, this is one of the things that's so fascinating about doing research in art history here in Jordan is you see the same characters pop up over and over again, and really have a stake in making this a place to, to produce art. And publicize art and so on, and to also conserve it, and to conserve what is considered valuable artistically and culturally in Jordan. And Amar Kamash is one of the big proponents of this um, conservation, and not changing or altering or renovating buildings too much, and staying uh, too true to sort of vernacular architecture in his own way, very different than the other architect that first mentioned, Austin Harrison. The interesting sort of echoes think about it. And for me, one of the interesting things about Tamar Tamash's work as um, a visual artist, and not even just architecture, is he's very much active in terms of documentation and preservation of architecture through his practice. And so this is one of his early works I found in a, a private collection here of a painting he was working on, or a building he was, he painted a building he was working on. He took a photograph from sort of surveys and he also painted over it and, and drew some lines on it. So you see him thinking about his photographic architectural work and then also in terms of his painting. And for me, I love process. I love seeing the materials and seeing how an artist is actually working. Um, and so his first project was also a museum, the Museum in Alcama of uh, Sharif Ali's house. So museums keep popping up as well in terms of research on Jordanian and art history. And along with Amar Kamash, another artist who was heavily involved in documentation and collecting and preserving heritage and artistic practices in Jordan, was Ali Jabri. And so his works. His works, again, you have documentary types of paintings, you might call them still lifes, whatever you want to call them. They show artistic heritage in Jordan, from ancient to Islamic to modern practices. And uh, what's so interesting about Ali Jabri's works, in terms of he was pulling the technological teams to Aqaba, to Ella, to the Dead Sea, all these places. And he was documenting the archaeologists. So the painting on the left, if you look at the red bag, you can see the animal on the back, it's a kangaroo. He was working with the Australian archaeological team down in. Uh, uh, the steps. So he puts the Australian uh, airplane bag in the painting. With the pottery the team was finding, with the mosaic, uh, the stick is a metered stick that you use in terms of archaeological surveys. And then I'm not sure if it's the painting is clear enough for you to see, but on the right it's a grid mapping a lot of the pottery shards they were finding at the site, which then shows the pottery around them. But on this painting, which is a private question here, uh, he hand numbered the pottery looking at the grids that the archaeologists were using. So he's literally like documenting as it looks like a historian, obsessive historian would, of uh, what the, the archaeological team was finding. So through Ali Jabri's work, you find these wonderfully intimate vignettes or documentary sort of paintings, but you also find a history of artistic practices or historical practices in Jordan. So Ali Jabri was one of these artists who was really interested in depicting what is being found or what is worth saving in Jordan in terms of art history or archaeology or, or cultural history or so on. And he loves to paint these pottery plates, the paintings on them. A lot of them are actually Islamic pottery, the Mamluks, the Fatimids, 
south of the pottery. So if you're familiar with the Zone of Dark History, you see how each other is maintained, and your brain just starts going. Um, and Ali Jabri, so he was also going off to villages and uh, looking at uh, different aspects of village life and rural life that was still existing in Jordan outside of the Amman bubble, which I think people here know the Amman bubble pretty well. So this is a painting he did in Amman in 1979. And then another painting, which you might recognize from Amman, is this painting. And then this gets back to my research now. Because this meeting is so cool. <laughs> what he was doing uh, while he was going to Miami, and he's, again, so he's documenting, he's really interested in, in the archaeological heritage of Jordan, artistic practice in Jordan, but also uh, magic practices. So Islamic material culture that you find all across the Arab world, Iran, and most of the Islamic world. You find these things like the hand of Fatima, which is this hand of the eye in it, and the Ahafez. These are talismanic invocations. And so this is material culture, everyday life, that is pre-Islamic, but was a, you find it all over the place, it's everywhere. It's the stuff that people, grandparents still have, or great grandparents still have. It was very common also amongst um, tribes and Bedouins, which might have a real reason why it's sometimes like this is a, a really big part of Jordanian, uh, we're seeing Jordanian museums here, a lot of this stuff, which ends like they're all in it. But this is a good painting. I came across uh, while doing research with the Museums in Amman project. And he would, the story behind this painting is he was in Amman and he liked to stay in this small hotel. And this was a hotel, one day they eventually get their first refrigerator. And supposedly people were really uh, uh, worried about harm coming to the refrigerator. And again, the refrigerator is uh, the first one you have, so food being preserved inside has to be protected. So they paint the hand of Fatima to protect the food inside of the refrigerator in Man. So this is the upper part of the freezer, and then you see the lamps and the boxes on top. And there's, I think you can see a fluorescent light on the left side. So Ali Shabri decided to paint this. So visually, artistically, this may not be that interesting to you, but in terms of historic interest and art historical interest, uh, I think it's a really fascinating. And I came across this painting at uh, Terrace at the Dark Flower Home for Arab Dress, which collects Palestinian and Jordanian or many types of Arab dress, clothing, as well as talismanic and amulet objects. And the one on the right is an absolute stunner. So if you haven't been to Terrace, I highly recommend it. Um, it's what a bride would wear, and it's covered. Those are all coins. A lot of them are Ottoman coins, or some of British Indian coins, or coins from Palestine and Jordan. So it's partly the dowry, and it's partly to protect the bride and to give her good luck. And every little thing, every bead, every tassel has some kind of symbolic value. So the interest in talismans and amulets is it's a way to get at sort of everyday life, especially women's artistic practices, which are often ignored in our history. Um, so there's, there's, for me, this is one of like why I'm interested in talismans and amulets, and, and so do other Islamic art historians are as well, as were many artists. And so another reason why Ali Jaffrey is so interesting was he, with his aunt, Sadia Adel, helped collect, curate, research, organize every square inch of the Jordan Museum of Popular Traditions. This opened in 1972, downtown, inside the amphitheater. So if you ever been to the amp, uh, there's two museums inside the Roman amphitheater, on the right and the left, the Slum of the Park, it's the members. The Folklore Museum, when you enter on the right, the Jordan Museum of Popular Traditions on the left. And this, to my mind, is a museum come art project. Because Ali Jabri's hand is all over this museum. He hand calligraphed every single label. So you can see in English and Arabic, corals, or marajan. And there's just these little touches that are very, in a sense, like creative or artistic. You see his hand behind these things. On the right side, you can see part of the coral that he brought from the Red Sea to put in the display case to show where coral comes from. And this is often Bedouin and Palestinian jewelry that women wear. So very much perceptive and aware and just a very careful hand in every display case in the, this museum. And this is one of my favorite things. Uh, these species that I call yellow or Hambar enamel. This is a talismanic or amulet tradition specific to the history of Amman. 
Um, they were very popular from the 1920s to the 1940s. Uh, silver, small fish, they're often fish, which I don't know why there's no fish here, but also a lot of fussy uh, earrings and a necklace. But what's interesting about these, and this comes from Ali Jabri's research and his didactic, so the information given comes from an artistic practice. Um, the reason they're so interesting is they were brought by the first settlers to modern Alman in the late 19th century. The Circassians and Armenians who came here, um, they brought this craft with them. And what's interesting is this yellow means black enamel. So they would use black soot in the engravings. So you can see the shavings and the shapes on the fish. The reason they're so popular is the black soot will not stick to silver that's low quality. So it only sticks to high quality silver. So the reason that these are so popular is because you knew you were getting good quality silver. You weren't getting ripped off when you bought these jewelry. And it's, uh, this is why they're so popular. It's an investment economically, but also in terms of protecting your body and yourself and, and all the amulet and talismanic magical uh, aspects. And so this is specifically historic to Amman because of the Circassians that came in the late 19th century. So Ali Jabri makes a point of bringing this out in the didactic of his museum, which is why I'm telling you this now. And again, if you look closely, you'll find these little hidden gems, like this small sketch that he did for the coffee display in the center of like one of the rooms. And they're very similar to his sketches of the archaeological surveys and so on that I showed you a few slides ago. So this relationship with this museum and this labeling goes back to this one artist's intense interest in Jordanian art history and heritage. And likewise, you can see he hand wrote on these wood blocks of all these bracelets and laid the names or some of the information along every single one. And so this is a photo. So it's tucked away inside the amphitheater. If you haven't been to this museum, also I highly recommend uh, going and visiting this museum. So uh, sort of to zoom out just a tiny bit and sort of talk about the nature of doing our historical research in Jordan and also in the region more broadly. Uh, Jordan has played a huge role actually in art historical publications of art in the Arab world. Uh, one of the first to come out, modern Arab art by Nana Shabut. She did most of her field work in Amman, um, it was after the Gulf War, um, the first Gulf War in 1990. So this is one of the premier texts if you're doing research on modern art in the Middle East or modern Arab art. Uh, which came from her fieldwork partly here in Amman as well as in Baghdad. And then you also have Arab Art Histories, the 2013 publication from Dara Muslim, which has many historically reflexive uh, contextual analytical essays. And I highly recommend this, essay, um, this volume as well if you're doing research. And then also with Jean Ali, who got her PhD from SOAS, the first PhD ever offered in Islamic uh, modern art from SOAS. So she actually became a scholar as well as a practicing artist, as well as founding the first art museum. So one of her books is the Modern Islamic Art, uh, deals with some of uh, uh, her research on artistic uh, practices, both in Jordan and in terms of the Islamic world. So again, Amman played a huge role if you're doing art history regionally or generally at all in terms of modern art or Islamic art history. And specifically to Jordan, uh, other texts, you have one that's both in English and Arabic, Modern Arts in Jordan, published by the National Gallery and writ writ written by uh, Wish Dahani. You have Afnama Tashkili, uh, which is the Ministry of Culture and Publication. Afnama Tashkili means uh, the uh, plastic arts of Jordan. And then on the right, another Ministry of Culture and Publication uh, with uh, Rafiq Baham, who is another artist uh, writing a lot in, uh, in terms of art history or uh, Jordan. And then some other volumes. Most of these are in the National Library. Uh, I think some are here, or the National Gallery also has a library. Uh, so again, dealing with Jordanian art history, there is writing on it, often in Arabic. Um, but the problem, the big problem that I continually encounter is where are the actual works? Where are the paintings? Where is the stuff? Because oftentimes you'll see paintings that like I've never seen any of these in any museums or any of the collections, like the one in the center. So uh, the question becomes, how do you actually do art historical research in Jordan? Which again, to my mind, is why museums are so interesting and so important. 
Because if people are going to do research in terms of artistic heritage and history in Jordan, you have to have access, you have to know where the stuff is. So this goes back to why um, the Museum Development Project has been hugely helpful for my own research as well as for understanding uh, local regional museum practices. So with the developments, if you came to my talk in May, I talked somewhat critically about the museums in the Gulf and sort of neoliberal, massive uh, sort of branding of museums. And the questions that artists like Wadi Ra are coming up with is what do these what role are these museums going to play in discussing the past or sort of in the future for artistic heritage practices in the region? Where is their sort of roots of their understanding of artistic practice coming from? And one way of trying to understand a different art historical heritage or history of the theology is to look at these small local museums, um, which is what the Museums of Amman Tragic is doing. This one example, Mantas and Islami, the Islamic Museum, you see, uh, has really fascinating collection. Half of it is stuff from the first king of Jordan, King Abdullah. The clock on the top uh, right corner is, I think the label says something like a the, this once belonged to our martyred king as he was assassinated in an Aqsa mosque. And then the, the rest of the stuff is archaeological landings. So, from archaeology around Jordan, uh, you find inscriptions and stuff from the Carib and so on. So, two sort of very different collections put together and called the Islamic Museum. Uh, so, that's fascinating. Uh, and this uh, museum is beside the blue King of Dela Mosque, I've never been. And they're very happy they never get visitors, so please go and check out this museum as well. Um, and another thing that's been really, if you're interested in visual arts and art history, uh, and visual culture especially, so not just art historical practices, not just modern art, but visual culture generally, there's two different uh, postage museums. And one is just halfway down the hill here towards downtown, the Museum of Jordanian Postage. Uh, it's also the Numismatics Society or Study of Coins. And they have postage stamps from the early history of Transjordan, of Palestine, up through today. So it's a way of seeing really interesting images of Amman in the 1940s. Here's the Parliament of Transjordan. And then you also have the special releases they had of artists, of paintings for stamps. I think it's from 2002. You have Mohana Dora, so the Woman of Salt appears again. And then also uh, Rafiq Baham and his calligraphic abstract paintings of Jerusalem. And not just Jordan. If you're interested in other artistic practices in the region, like Iraq, you can find these stamps. So we have the Republic of Iraq, second anniversary of oil nationalization, which is a stunning painting. We've got the Samara Mosque in the background, and all these sort of socialist realist uh, sort of depictions. And then on the right, you have a painting from Al Hariri's Bakhamat, one of the most famous um, uh, or so early Islamic miniature paintings from the 12th century back. So you have two very different images of Iraq that is a part of uh, its postage text of visual culture. And so people use these, they send letters overseas, or they send them to their friends. So stamps circulate in a way that spreads visual culture in a very different way than an exhibition at a gallery or a museum. This is one of my interests in visual culture as well. And along with these museums being interesting places to find stuff, you have the new museum being built. So you have the Jordan Museum. And you have these Ayn Bizal statues. And so these used to be in the Citadel Museum. And the Citadel Museum also used to have the Dead Sea Scrolls. And both of these collections are now in the New Jordan Museum downtown in Massanine. And so, again, our interest in these museums is to understand what's these relationships with the new museums being built or planned to be built here in Jordan with the past museums, with these older, smaller, um, more care worn museums. And so trying to figure out what is the future of museums in Jordan or the future of museums in the region as well. Is it going to turn into Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Doha? Or is there a way to think more historically reflexively about museum practices here in Jordan? And this is another museum that's not open yet. It will be the Tank Museum or the Military Museum. And you see this massive structure that's being built that's going to hold a lot of tanks and black ops. So this is another interesting development uh, of a museum here in Amman, and there's more to discuss about this if you're interested. And 
along with museums, along with institutions of art historically named Georgian, you have these informal places as well. So Napsh, which is a cafe here in Web Day, has an exhibition of one of the foremost political cartoonists in the world, um, Imad Hajaj, the Jordanian cartoonist behind the caricature figure, Abu Mahshu, who I know many uh, artists and my friends hold dear here. They are actively archiving some of his works. And specifically at this exhibition, um, I don't know if it's still going on yet, because they've been closed for a while. Uh, but it's looking at a lot of these cartoons from the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq. So it's very political uh, cartoon history against U.S. intervention in the region. And this uh, cartoon, I feel like, is very prescient even for today. And sort of the role that foreign intervention and warfare and so on is continuing to play. So this is a Jordanian cartoonist's perspective on the impacts of 9-11. Uh, a year later, the Democratic Club today as well. You can see the two matchsticks are obviously the Twin Towers and the rest of the world on fire. And so you have an informal sort of archive taking, uh, informal archives that are publicly accessible happening. And then you also have responses to some of these archives or to these other interests. So Fada in Jabal Ahmad, Fada 317 is an informal art center. Um, there are also street artists, graffiti artists that are going around Amman as well. But they had an exhibition of artists uh, responding and depicting Abu Mahshu. Uh, so, again, so this is happening today in contemporary Jordanian art. Um, so, I'm interested in the role that these archives or this sort of, uh, sort of the, by responding to Abu Mahshu, by making the responses to Iman Hajjaj. Our younger artists then became a part of Jordanian art history in a very strong way. So these new trajectories of thinking about art history in Jordan. And likewise, um, you see artists uh, going to places and trying new things. And it's sometimes by doing art so the research you find out that maybe it's not always new. Uh, this photograph on the left is from spring session this year when uh, they took over Culture Street, which is a sort of share at the Bafa which has a gallery and exhibition space that wasn't ever really used. And so some artistic uh, practices and experimentations were happening in that street. Uh, uh, so it's a question of, in terms of the urban topography of Amman, sort of like what, uh, did everything only happen downtown in Web Bay and Jabal Amman, or are there other spaces for art in Jordan as well? And you find out that actually artists are in PS to it, and they were in Shinsani. Uh, as well. Uh, Mohammed Dora was painting uh, this mural. Uh, the building no longer exists, but this was something that's uh, quite interesting in terms of art historical research. As when we do it, it actually gives new meanings to contemporary art practices as well. So, sort of to conclude, I guess, this uh, discussion of some of the research I've been doing. Um, the goal for this was to sort of give a sense of what I've seen of what Jordanian art history is through my research for my project. So I'm not researching Jordanian art history itself, and yet by doing research here, you get a sense, you get a specific sort of sense or narrative of Jordanian art history. And so there, I know that there are some art historians working here, but there's not a lot of us. So the goal is maybe, I think it would be great, is to make this a series. So to have uh, art historians or artists interested in doing research practices do talks on Jordanian art history. Because this should be the first of many talks at Darat in terms of what Jordanian art history is, what it has been, what it will be. Is it important? Should we think about it? You know, what is it? And from my standpoint, um, doing research on Islamic material culture in the modern Middle East, what I found that was most interesting about Jordanian art history has been the role of its artists in the development of museums. So that's sort of the concluding sort of thought that I have. Many of the people that I talked about are in this room, so I'm hoping we can have maybe a discussion or anyone has any questions about research or anything, I'm happy to share more. So thank you all for your attention.
Are there any questions or is it not about encouragement of like having students and school children go to museums. So will your research offer a solution of involving schools and going to these museums? Like if you go to most of these places they are empty. Yeah. Like you don't have any visitors, which is quite a shame. Yeah. So will you be working on that or will you like ask artists, like Julian artists to do that? Will you collaboration with our food and thank you very much. Thank you. That would be amazing. That's a great idea. I think if there's people in this room who could also speak better to that than the Arab team or Nora are around. But that is part of the goal, is to publicize these museums first off. So if we're going to have a book informing our museums of online, sort of that's the next thing. That's part of why we're using history of some of them. Um, education is a huge, huge subject that we really need to be talked about more in terms of art practice, in terms 
terms of our history, in terms of some of the things, um, and in terms of what is possible or for the future, I feel like everyone in this room could maybe say something or have a, an idea or a thought, because it's definitely not something that I know how to speak about. Uh, but yeah, it's a great question. It's a really, really big problem, because by doing, I mean, for me, doing this research, I learn more from people than I do from actual books. I, so going to places. So in terms of the education of what even is the history of our practices here, I mean, people that are older know a lot, but like they're not going to be around forever. So how do we maintain this? How do we preserve this information? There should be, there should be historical publications about the Indian arts, and that can be used in educational sort of platforms and so on. Um, does anyone else want to talk about this? It's a great question. The mic, please. Thank you. Thomas. We have about three universities, or maybe more, mm -hmm. that give a major in museum one. Okay. But we don't see the graduates. They go to something else. Mm -hmm. There's somebody else. Can you introduce yourself to the audience? We don't meet the graduates. Okay. They, get, they appear in, in large numbers, they graduate in the museum uh, major, oh. and they don't go to the museums, either the museums, the museums here in Canada, Canada. They, so many, or uh, they, do, they don't do the last period, which is the practice experience. I don't know why, but I want to find somebody to, uh, to be a curator. I don't find a curator. To be a curator. Yeah. Uh, this is the Though there are about more than ten universities that give it as a major. But they all you find the graduates also in Indoor and don't say. They go into something else. Maybe they go into office work, go into, not into museums. Which is too bad. Another thing, I never heard of the Islamic Museum. What is it? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, we ask you. It's not only uh, you. It, no, it's not. No, it's in King Abdel uh, The Blue Dome, it's just on the other side of Abdelli. Yeah, it's inside. Does it belong? Does it belong to the university? I think it's the ministry, the Walks Ministry, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think. I think. Huh? And we only saw the gate, we didn't see the inside. <laughs> Beautiful gate. <laughs> uh, I think part of the problem is the concept of education as both learning rather than experiential. Uh, I teach here, and, and when I'm here, I force watch my students. Museums and you know sites, archaeological sites, and many of them have never been to even Petra in their university. Uh, so it, it's a real problem, and I think it has to do with the the idea of education here. Mm -hmm. With regard to GE, you know, it's memory, it's growth, right. it's not experiential. And I think that's the root. That that's where it has to be worked at, and mm -hmm. and also the administration doesn't make it easy sometimes for trips. And to do things, you know, you're looking at the pots and guns with suspicion. Oh, you're having fun. Oh, there's something wrong with that. You know, so it, it, it's, it's really a very basic concept of education. I think that's where it has to, the administration at the time has to enforce those policies. But my second question is I'm interested in the fish. Yeah, <laughs> this little bit. I saw a picture that Kelvin Down, who restores antique photographs. In Jasmine House, actually, is a good map. Mm -hmm. And he showed a picture of Mon, and it had a river in the middle of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. so many of our fish at that time. I forgot to mention that, actually, that's a great point. Um, no, maybe that's why Circadian started making fish. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> no, the fishies are great. And it's, it's interesting because they're, so that again, so the river is now underground, it's like a tiny stream, so we don't. Again, so I forgot, I, I used to know, but I forgot there was a river throughout the whole point in the late 18th century. So the fish then speak to, again, a different part of the urban history of Alma and the developments. That's a good question. Thank you. 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 Thank
point. And going back to the issue of education, I mean, I think finances and economics play a huge role in that. If there's no funding for education, if it, and also for museums, then how do they play a role in sort of cultural literacy in, amongst students in Jordan? Um, most of these museums are badly need of funding. They're dusty. They need renovations. They need so much help and assistance, and they have so many interesting things. Um, so this is probably what we want to do with museums and other projects to publicize that and get the information out there. Because again, so not to get all uh, into the world view, but you see what's happening in Syria. You saw what happened in Iraq with the invasion, the complete loss of the modern art museum in Baghdad, and the dispersal of that history. What's happening in Yemen? What's happening? So much to cultural heritage in the region. All the more reason why Jordan's museums are precious and should be appreciated, and understood, and explored. And art, like, people should have fun going and seeing this stuff. Some of which makes no sense. Why is this here? But that's part of the fun. And also in terms of it's interesting for its sort of value, I think. Yeah, thank you for your questions and comments. Yes, hello. Good evening. Thank you for all your information. Sorry. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. So basically, my question is all about like if this is we can if I can call it like it's a kind of a contemporary art of Jordan or the old MENA region. My question basically is like, can we really predict the future of art history or like modern art in Jordan or like the past modern, if we can call it? I don't know what's the clues, which is the right term for it, but like. My question is, what is reaching, what is the future of art in Jordan, according to what's going on in the whole in the region nowadays? If that can affect the reality of art or reality itself? That's a great question. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, that is a really important question that I think many of the people in this room can talk about more. There, because there are many of the artists that are have a stake and are really invested in the future of artistic practice regionally, but also here in Amman, <laughs> are they're considering this question every day. But we don't know what the future holds. Well, like, yeah. look, Miss Rudan just said, <laughs> yeah. people are going to schools, to universities. They are learning everything, but like lack of people who are interested in knowing anything about museology or museum or like related to anything related to museums or library. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, but like I would really, I'm really interested if there is going to be anything, any other researches for you that are related to this field. We, I think so. I hope so. I think that some of the projects I mentioned are ongoing. Um, and there's other artistic heritage, architectural heritage projects ongoing as well. Um, and one project I can sort of talk about briefly um, that uh, hopefully we'll be working on, um, there is an Islamic traditional arts college in Amman. It's now an Islamic uh, technical or science college as well. The reason that college was founded was because of the destruction of the Minbar al-Aqsa in 1969. So it's looking at the sort of the geopolitics of occupation and warfare and how it creates, it's not even a revival as long as traditional art, but also like it starts, like they had to figure out how to build new minbar because that was one of the big goals of the Hashemite um, government was to get the minbar back inside al Aqsa Mosque. So they actually created something to make an Islamic arts college here. They've never been that before. They've never been really techniques for making minbars in Jordan itself. So the modern dynamics of Islamic material culture, in that sense, are heavily impacted uh, in that way. So that's another project that I didn't have time to talk about right now. But um, no, I think there's a lot of potential and interest. There's just so much interesting stuff here that people don't know about, which is one of the goals of this talk, was to talk about some of the research projects that I'm doing and that others are doing as well. Um, and if you're interested, we can talk more about if you have any other ideas. And there's a lot of people going on here. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, hi. Hi. So you mentioned that they uh, that there were impressionism movements happening in the 80s here? Yes. Um, the only thing about the movements that we have, so there was impression, impressionism, cubism, um, abstraction, but were they happening in time of the West, or was there a delay, or was there the following that its own chronological progression of art? Yeah. Now this is a really, uh, that's a great question because 
this is one of the uh, sort of uh, ways of doing artistic research that's been put forward about how to study modern art in the rest of the world. That's not European modernism or American modernism. And one of the ideas is that the history of different movements that you find commonly in terms of modern art worldwide is they have different chronologies. So that is definitely one way to think about it, is that Jordan had his own unique special surrealist movement, roots in the 80s, and impressionist movement, and so on. Um, and many of these artists were going overseas to study uh, art, again, because there wasn't a school for training art here at until like the mid 1980s. Um, so that might have played a role in it as well. I haven't done that much research on this yet, so I can't. Like, the part of the reason why I threw this in the counterpoint is because when I was talking with Amar Tamash, he told me that the Impressionist movement um, of the East Jordan by Fawad Mimi was very important for him and the young artists. So, like, you hear it from artists themselves what these movements are and how they were interesting and important to their work today. So, that's for me what's interesting, but I don't know enough about the movements, so I wanted to say whether or not specifically Jordanian or maybe more regional or Arab or so on. But that is totally a wide open art historical field. If anyone wants to actually investigate surrealism, Jordanian modern arts, or impressions of why this happened in the 80s, is it because they founded the Jordan National Gallery of Fine Arts? And they had a lot of Orientalist paintings from 19th century France and Europe and, and so on. But it's not there anymore. They sold the collection. But they used to have a lot of European impressionist works and surrealist works. So that might have played a role in this as well. But that's just me guessing. So you can see that there was to make a point of reference to the art happening here regardless of how it unfolded. What do you mean? In terms of reference, in terms of the artist going and setting I mean, as, as, as influence in general, regardless of like, whether it happened um, in oh. some order or not. I wouldn't say, I don't use the term influence okay. in terms of art, because it's just, it's such a, it, it's, it, it misses up the intricacies of how artists create and produce. Whether an artist is influenced by something or not, no, it's, it's usually much more interesting than that. So that's not how I think about it, but I haven't worked, again, I haven't been working on those moments. Um, but they're interesting in terms of our historical developments in Jordan relating to these two art museums. So that's my interest. But if you're interested in them, and want to do research, I think one can do that. Thank you. So, what word would you use to describe the influence in art? Oh, God. <laughs> um, I, I mean, again, it's, history is strange, it's transformative. You find different moments, different revivals, and so on. So, I think that East West binary is a false binary because you have Crusader art made by Muslims for Christians. You have so it, it's it's much more complex and interesting than saying that there's a trajectory of art historical influence from one movement from European abstraction to abstraction in Brazil. There's people and objects involved. So it's following the people, it's following the objects as the sources that then unpacks the art historical narratives that you come up with that. Does that help explain a bit more? I just got yeah. a question. Thanks very much for that. And about the sport, so how Jordan Ford is a when Jordan Ford is what we now know to be Jordan, mm -hmm. how the kind of history of art complicates that. You know, I'm kind of interested in surely there was art happening in the area that we now call Jordan before that. And now so how does this kind of how does what, what we see when you're the same as Jordan Ford art kind of complicates with a kind of a wider history of the region? Yeah. Um no, I focus specifically on things that might be categorized as Jordanian. I did not touch on Palestinian art because there is a lot of great people working on that in Jordan. There's a lot of Palestinian visual culture and art historical sort of practices that you can talk about in relation to Jordanian history, obviously with the history of Jordan and Palestine as it is. You also have Lebanese artists actually coming in the late 19th century. Um Onsi of um, so you have some early uh, landscape painters from Lebanon that also came to Jordan in the early 1920s. Um, I'm not, but they also went to Jerusalem as well. So you have other artists that were really, I mean, Beirut's art center and Cairo's art centers were much older because uh, they had arts institutions founded very early on. Um, so you have these artists circulating as well. So 
There's an interesting role we play in the fact just regional for the circulations um, related to the history of Jordan. Um, I would say Palestine, again, is one of the, the bigger sort of art historical uh, genealogies that I didn't have time and didn't touch on. Um, but there are a lot of people working on that as well. Especially, there are many resources in Amman before that. So like, again, the research on the Citadel Museum unfolded or unpacked a lot of really interesting information about the Palestine Cultural Museum. And these two museums were actually, um, after 1948, they were both uh, controlled and maintained by the Jordanian government until 67, when Israel took over the West Bank. So the history of these two museums is interesting in terms of the history of Jordan, as well as the history of artistic and material culture. <laughs> There's no more questions. Thank you all so much for coming and for all of you. Conversations outside of the questions, and also my, I'm on Facebook or email, or you can get in touch with there, get in touch with me. And there's, yeah, there's so much to do. There's a lot to do. So it's just a small slice, I think, of research on the internet. So thank you.